Well, I can't see you guys, but hi. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. What's going on? Um, let me, I should so we're talking about everybody's favorite character after the last season. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to start um, by everyone introducing themselves on the table and saying um, kind of how you got here and what your relationship is to Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, my name is Kev. Um, I'm a bridge for you on YouTube. Uh, I'm here because I absolutely love the characters, their stories, their flaws, uh, everything about this, everything about A Song of Ice and Fire and the show Game of Thrones, Raman Jwadi, um, I think I pronounced that wrong. But yeah, that's why I'm here. I love this. I guess, no, above all, the real reason is I have so many friends in the community and they're all coming here, so I wanted to come too. They're probably out there, they're probably not, I don't know, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, my name's Casey. Um, I'm part of the Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast. Um, I just started watching the show one day and ended up loving it so much that I read the books. And then I got involved in this really niche com uh, group of people online that do a podcast together. Um, and yeah. Uh, my name is Quinn. I have a YouTube channel called Ideas of Ice and Fire, and I cover various science fiction and fantasy books. I started with A Song of Ice and Fire. That's why my channel is called Ideas of Ice and Fire, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my name is Daphne Olive. Um, I do not officially cover Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I am a jewelry designer. I'm also a podcaster. Um, my main podcast is called Fathoms Deep. It is about another television show, Black Sails. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my other podcast, which is younger and still very active, is younger and still very active is uh, Can I Just Say, where we talk generally about literature, film, television, including Game of Thrones. Uh, I also am, uh, as of very recently, a television story um, consultant working with the creators of Black Sails on a new show. Ooh. All right, so let's start. I want to start with like, you know, an easier question. Um, basically <laughs> your favorite thing, which is how we actually usually end our podcast, but I thought it's a good way to start. So, so why don't each of you tell me or tell us what your, like, your favorite thematic or moment, th thematic thing or moment in Daenerys' story? Well, I guess, you want me to start? Yeah, Sorry. go for it. So for me, Daenerys is a really interesting character because A, I come from a town called Sparta. I grew up loving Spartacus, right? I don't know if you guys know that story, but um, my channel's Bridge 4. That's, I don't want to give spoilers away, but I absolutely loved her from day one because she's a breaker of chains, and that's the coolest type of character in fantasy and fiction and in real life. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything's more quintessentially Danny um, than the Dracari scene, um, both in books and show. Um, you just really start to, I mean, you really fall in love with her with that scene. Um, obviously, there's some different things that happen later on, um, <laughs> but that scene is really powerful for me. Um, I like Danny's journey from kind of this meek, innocent little girl, and then becoming someone that realizes that she has inherent power and harnessing that power and using it. That's what I like. Um, I think, I mean, I'm going to also choose, choose the, the second Dracarys, the, the Slaver's Bay Dracarys. Uh, I have a slightly different reason why I love it so much. Uh, what I like. Um, I think, I mean, I'm going to also choose, choose the, the second Dracarys, the, the Slaver's Bay Dracarys. Uh, I have a slightly different reason why I love it so much. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's really fun. It's a very satisfying moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, I happen to be a person who loves tragic heroes. And um, for me, the beautiful thing about that moment is that we did, that we watched her go from subjugated person to person who finds her own power to this moment of being a liberator. But what's really fun for me personally about that moment is that you can see with varying levels of success, they managed to call back to that moment because it's that moment where She's the liberator, and he, every, it's hard for me to imagine that there was a single person who watched the show in that moment who wasn't, like, just cheering for her. Like, just get up on your I felt like had to happen. They were, where power starts to overtake her, and where that exact thing that was, that was the moment where you're so exalted was going to be the moment that you were going to have to reevaluate with time and start thinking, 
wait a minute, you know, power in the hands of a good person is amazing, but this level of power can also be terrifying. Yeah. Guys, can I add something? Because I kind of lied on my response. <laughs> Okay, I, I said I loved her from day one because she's a breaker of chains. She didn't break any chains on day one. But she did kind of break some chains. It was Danny 2, her second chapter, and it was like her second or third scene in the show. She broke chains of her own, I mean, or she started to. She didn't really break them until she was out in the Dothraki Sea and she got off her horse. But when she got, I personally think that she has a warging bond with that silver filly, that the number one horse in the story. <laughs> eh, Sandra's horse is pretty awesome. But um, when she gets on that horse, there's a line that sticks out to me that I never really hear people talk about, but it's that, like, she's like, she, was, like, she's like, she wasn't afraid. It, perhaps for the first time in her life, she wasn't afraid. And I think part of that's her, her absorbing some of the, the, uh, the silver filly, but even though that does take away from her own growth. But man, what a line. Like, she literally, we're in her second chapter, we learned that her entire life, she's been afraid every moment of her life until that moment. Can you imagine? Yeah. Hmm. No, there, it's so interesting now with the end of the show, like, you know, trying to like retrospect our feelings with everything. Um, like that Drakari scene is such a powerful scene to me and it still is a very powerful scene to me. Um, but like when you're thinking about the, the last season, it's just like, oh, the, it, was this a good thing? Like, and I come to the conclusion that she's killing slave owners and I think that's a good thing ultimately. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Yeah, the, that Jakar scene in, in Astapor, that's one of the scenes that I said was probably better in the show than it was in the book. Because uh, in the show, you don't, if you haven't said, was probably better in the show than it was in the book. Because uh, in the show, you don't, if you haven't read the books, you don't necessarily know that Daenerys speaks Valyrian. Mm -hmm. She understands what he's, how he's that, insulting her. That's he actually that. the best part is when she starts speaking. Yeah. <laughs> when she turned around and she said, a dragon is not a slave. That is one of the most epic yeah. moments in Game of Thrones history. Yeah, it's so powerful. Yeah. To, to play devil's out, no, no, you're, you're right. The show is awesome in that. But something that the book, you know, because the book and the show, they have different tools, right? The show is like a musical sure. score. I like the books better too. It's so with the books, I love, the, I love them both. <laughs> but in the books, do you get something, uh, so like, so Barrison comes up to her and he says something like, it's better, because Barrison does not want to do it. He's like, it's better to be a beggar than a, um, a slaver. And she's like, what do you know about being either? Because I've been both, right? Um, and, then, and then she snaps at him. And then uh, Jorah comes up to her and Jorah's like, how many? And she, how many men? And she's like, men? These are eunuchs. They are bricks. These are not humans. They kill puppies. They kill sad. A lot of her story deals with children. I, I mean, her childhood was stolen from her. Oh, we got to get to that. But, um, <laughs> but she's like super, super pissed. But in the, both of them in that scene, before the Drakari scene in the books, she snaps at them. I think that with Jorah, I think it's like her fury, her fury astounded him or something like that. It just, it's a pretty interesting line. It's a very early sign that uh, she's got, everything she does almost is from a good place. But man, she can snap. Well, and I think that's, I mean, that's what's really interesting ultimately is that she... She, ha she lives in this beautiful space where, where she, I mean beautiful, sorry, I like tragic heroes. I think I said that already. <laughs> it's a beautiful space for someone like me who loves that tension between, between someone who wants so much to be good and who has draws of things that are maybe less in their control. I mean, it's, that's like part of one of the questions with her is like how much magic her is like how much magic is in her control and how much yeah. her magic is controlling her. And that that's just a very human story. Like we all want, we all want to be good or, you know, most people want to be good. I'm going to assume that everyone in this room wants to be good. And we have all of these things that all of these motivations outside of that, that are very human. We have loyalty, we have our families, we have, we have our own, you know, scars from our from our lives that motivate us in certain ways or trigger us in certain ways and her story is a really interesting investigation again i always have to kind of temper that by saying that it wasn't always perfectly executed but it had the potential to be one of the greatest investigations of that because her she has these dueling drives of wanting to be a liberator and be good and she wants that so clearly i don't think there's ever a moment even at the end clearly i don't think there's ever a moment even at the end i actually believe that she actually still wants that yeah. but the power and and her allegiances and her own scars are are also things that drive her and 
and again, I just think that that's the most human story. And in a way, for me, that's much more interesting than heroes that get to just be heroic, because to be heroic and battle your own demons at the same time is, is that's the true heroism. I mean, there is a lot of arguments we can make about, like, you know, um, if the path that the show made for Danny to become this was great or not. But I think ultimately, and if you look at the story as a whole, especially um, putting George into play here, like, it, it makes sense that he would make some kind of story about, you know, this person that was always prophesized to be great, the person that was supposed to be queen, the person that was power, and then for all of a sudden just to turn like that is like pushing like you know crumpling up that trope or whatever and throwing it away and I think that is a very powerful thing to that I hope to be able to read about at some point mm -hmm. <laughs> I would also like to read about it because I guess I'll, I was going to be careful about the ending but now yeah. we're just going with there's it like a, yeah, we're going with it there's a passage in a clash of kings where Daenerys is saying something like I have no wish to burn King's Landing to a smoking ruin. I want to help the people. Mm -hmm. So it makes it more powerful if George R. R. Martin does do that in the books and you, ha and you see her kind of become this. You know what I mean? Because it would be like, how did it get this far? I tried to do so many good things. I tried to help so many people and still this has happened. Right. No, and I think, I mean, it will be hopefully interesting to see how <laughs> he does that because he is so good at subverting even the tropes that he established. Yeah. Um, the... The part of it that I'm, the part of it that I'm hoping to get slash my only real criticism. I know a lot of people are mad that she was killed. We're mad that she did bad things in the end. My only argument, as someone who who likes to analyze how television is made, is that the my only real argument is that, is that they took us out of her point of view. Um, is they that took they took us out of her point of view. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Sorry. Okay, sorry. So point of view, right. Point of view in television is like when you feel like you're like, like in a book, right? This, these are books that are very much based on the idea that certain characters are point of view characters, right? Because we're hearing their thoughts, which obviously you can't do in a television sure. show. But there are a lot of mechanics by which you can recreate that when you're doing television or film. And so the fact that in the Bells, like we had been in her point of view a lot, even in season eight, although I feel like a lot less than in earlier seasons, but the fact that this dramatic turn, we're not with her. We don't actually like the show, you know, kind of gave us a list, a checklist of things that like might have made it happen, but we're not actually experiencing it with her and that's what it means to be in someone's point of view. And so that is a way that, that that visual storytelling gives you sympathy for a character. And so what happened in the story is that she shifted from being a subject of the story to becoming an object of the story. She became, at that point, a force of nature in a way, which may have been their point. I just don't agree with that as a good way to tell her story. So they, she became an object for the other characters to deal with at that point. And I feel like that was just a wasted opportunity with a character that we had spent so long being deep inside her personal conflict and such a meaty, important personal conflict for us at the very end of that personal conflict to have not really clicked for us at the very end of that personal conflict to have not really get to be with her to, for that was very sad for me. And that, and that conflict is at the heart of... Clap. Yeah. I was going to say that conflict is at the heart of Danny's story. It's what it's about. It's about her trying to be good and balancing that with her underlying ruthless nature. I mean, also, we don't even see her face while she's right. burning the city. No, we lights. don't. We see her in the distance. Yeah. She's just like this fireball in the distance. Sorry, I was going to be much more I, measured I about my her. talking. <laughs> I've been with her for like for eight seasons and like however video many years we're reading the books. I was with her. I have video evidence of like being like no in that moment where she had to make where she made that final decision. I was Danny. No, no, no. I was so with her, but obviously like, we're all entitled to our own opinions. But no, of course, like, of course. I was very much with her. Man, it killed me. Yeah. No, I I was very much like you know I was sitting in bed watching it. And just like, like you, you know, I'm a very emotional person, and I just started crying, and I was just like, like mourning the loss of this character, and then oh, I'm gonna have to do a panel on this <laughs> in a couple months. Yeah, we all signed up prior to knowing where. <laughs> yes, we yeah. did. Oh. Yes, we did. We all signed up yeah. <laughs> somewhere early in season. When she <laughs> season started, eight, I think. <laughs> when Daenerys started burning the children, 
Oh. I just I just did like this, and I was like, oh my yeah. god, she's gonna kill them all. And I was like, Jon Snow is gonna kill her in the next episode. And I just saw where they were going with it, and it was just heartbreaking. Just, it was heartbreaking and depressing, and it was just like I didn't even. See, I'm still gonna argue that there's a way to do that story where there it, definitely, oh, no, is. There definitely is. is. But they didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I was I was really worried. I'm just not worried. Yeah. <laughs> you were so. Oh my god. Um, okay, so can I? Wait, bring can I throw out something? I found this recently in the sure, last sure. couple of days. So when she's in, and this is a book thing. Sorry. Um, well, I mean, it happens kind of in the show. It's differently. So you know, his daughter's a Lorak, right? The dude with the crazy, the crazy name. Can't spell that. But he um. So they, try, I forget if it's him or someone else, basically says that you got to marry him because like, men have place in the, in the leadership structure over there, right? Like, you may be a good conqueror, but you know, he could be the leader, so to say. It, it's crap, right? But um, in that scene, this, whoever says it, whether it's him or someone else says it, says like, you've got to do this, otherwise your reign is going to end in fire and blood. And as, I don't know, like, I, I do a lot of data mining, meaning I've read these books so many times, I find clues that aren't actually clues, it's just me data mining and finding something and then applying it to what actually happens. Maybe that's that, or... Maybe George R. R. Morton knows what's going to happen, and that line is subtle foreshadowing to her reign ending in fire and blood. There's a lot of clues like that, like the end yeah. of A Dance with Dragons, where she's, it's going through her head, dragons plant no trees, dragons conquer, dragons Ooh. are fire and blood. Uh, like you're trying to do this thing and rule in the East, and, but you're not a ruler, you are a conqueror. Mm -hmm. um, oh, anyway. that's a really good dichotomy to yeah. talk about. Like, what is the difference between a ruler and a conqueror, and how, how does her story expand on that? Yeah, and it's the question. Expand on that. Yeah, and it's the question of like whether or not a good conqueror makes a good ruler, and obviously not Robert Baratheon. Right. I mean, that's absolutely a theme out theme throughout the whole yeah, book. For sure. Yeah. And it seems like at the end of her story, she really has only been a conqueror. There, the ruling. I mean, show-wise, I think that it was a little bit different. But in the book, we really get to get to see how she's ruling and it's you know there's a lot of things that aren't really going well she's kind of forced to marry um and to like be approved from the wealthy people there that she was originally fighting against and um it seems that that will be her end game well to i would like to posit that like there is actually an argument that possibly ruling is less effective for storytelling than yeah. conquering. Not that I'm advocating that, I'm just thinking that I was like, yeah, when she's trying to rule is actually her most boring time in both the books and in the show. <laughs> Daenerys took, she took a lot on her shoulders. She went, she went to the East, tried to get rid of the slave trade, totally destabilized everything, messed up the economy. And I mean, it's just a really difficult situation. And there's even a point in the books where slaves, former slaves come to her and they're like, can we sell ourselves back into right. slavery? Oh, God, I remember that. It's like, how do you deal with that as, as a, yeah, so that's. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't have the answer. To yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> so she's dealing with real, she's making really hard decisions. Some of the hardest decisions of any characters. Well, and it's interesting. I was just talking with a friend about totally different storylines, but we were talking about um, Tywin and Tyrion Lannister and how like basically the people who end up ruling who end up you know doing legislation and making choices on how to like keep people fed and stuff like that end up in these stories being the ones who are unnamed they are the ones who don't end up in history yeah the conquerors <laughs> so conquerors are the ones who end up in the history books but the people who actually just <laughs> like make sure that sewers who actually just <laughs> like make sure that sewers work or things like that they never end up in the, and, yeah. and I, I would argue that that is also part of her story, that it's not just about, about riding dragons and being the mother of dragons, but she does, um, I think, Casey, you brought this up, right, in the, in the, in a, when we were talking, in our notes ahead of time, like this, that she's a Targaryen. Like, she's not just like a random woman who is, who, you know, had been sold into marriage and had horrible things happen to her and happens to have magic. She is a Targaryen and that is, and she's the last Targaryen. So that, like, do you all want to talk about that a little bit? Like the, how that is part of her storyline? Well, there's so much legacy to like live up to, um, especially um, if you've read Fire and Blood, like the, there's so much history behind the name and behind where they came from, even in Valyria. Um, and you know, I would feel like it would be a lot of pressure to live up to that. And I think that um, she is a very powerful, you know, especially when she gets the dragons, like just really embracing that she is the mother of these dragons and that they're her children and she's going to, you know, fly with them and be with them. 
I think that in the books, there is a bit of evidence that Danny doesn't really want to rule that much. Mm -hmm. Ruling the Seven Kingdoms was Viserys' dream. And all she ever longed for was a house with awesome. a red door. Right. That's what she always right. wanted. Oh, no, that's true. Uh, and so I think she kind of took on that mantle because he was gone. I am the last Targaryen in the world and right. I have to do this. Right, it's a responsibility yeah. of her family's story. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder how much resentment will end up or in the show, like I think it was pretty apparent, like she's had a lot of resentment. Like she, her lover isn't in love with her anymore. There's people, her her friends that she brought here are dead. Um, many many of them, um, many many of them. Um, like why did like I I feel like she was probably questioning at that point um, in episode five, like why am I doing all this? I don't even want or need this. Like Daenerys could have flown her dragons anywhere to rule. She didn't have to try and take Westeros. She could have, I don't know. <laughs> before, this, before this season, I had a dream that Danny would just fly off on her dragons into a shy Valyria. <laughs> oh, and sweetie. It's I just know. not that kind of story. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But I had that dream. See, I, always I wanted, totally get it. <laughs> I always wanted Daenerys to fly back to Valyria and reestablish Valyria. Yeah. Be like, that would be new cool. Valyria. That would be cool. Yeah, still. You think it's safe there? I mean, in terms of like, a dragon was there, so. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, she's a Targaryen. She can handle it. I mean, Tyrion and, and what's his name drove through. All right. Well, <laughs> what's his name? alternate endings are lovely. <laughs> this story. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so I wanted to talk like when we're talking about, you know, these forces that are driving her. Um, I think it would be really interesting to talk about the characters that bring out different sides of her and Ooh. like and what we think about like who's doing that. Like I spent a lot of time it's really interesting to watch um how different characters temper her at different times and how some of the people I feel like like everyone I, I always had this like sense that Jorah's always like the person who's like, you know, calm down person, but there are moments where he's not that guy. Yeah. It is really interesting, like, at what points different characters are... Okay, fanning the flames is a really bad term to use, like, that just is too... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a term I would use in another story. But, like, where, where, they, where, where different characters are in her sphere are um, supporting different aspects of her personality. Do you all have well, in any... The show. Supporting different aspects of her personality. Do you all have well, in any... in the show... Oh. Dario Naharis is definitely like pushing, be ruthless as possible, yep. kill as conquer, take your dragons and burn everybody that you possibly can. I think that's can. just because he thinks it's hot. Yeah. And <laughs> Literally. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, it's impossible I to know. avoid these puns. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the pretty much the most annoying part about Dance with Dragons is Daenerys going on about Dario. Like, shut up. <laughs> oh my god, I love Dario so much. But she's like 13, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can I mention a couple things just about Jorah? Because you said people who sure, influenced sure. her. Absolutely. So obviously Jorah was, at least in the show, we don't know how exactly it's going to go down in the books. That, that was a huge loss for her. Would she, have even in, like, would she have made the same decision if he was around? Well, part of why she was even in that place emotionally was because she lost him, and, among other people. But a couple things about Jorah. First off, just um, it, this is a book only, it's uh, the details from the books for this. Oh, it's so cool. So, so she has, um, she gets these bride gifts, right? She gets three bride gifts, I think. Oh, man. And then um, they, they try to take them from her. It's like, nope, these are mine. And then uh, she gives one to like Ricaro and one to Jogo, whoever. And they're like, Khaleesi, or they, she gives three of them away. Like, we can't, and she says, you're my blood rider. We can't be your blood rider. You're a woman. And she just kind of looks to the next one. She ignores like they even said it, right? It didn't even happen. Then she gets to Jorah. Jorah, like, will you be my first to my queen's guard, I think she says. And he says, like, like, absolutely. Or yes. Like, nothing. No, no questions asked. Boom, he's the man. I mean, and even then, he was kind of shady. He was still working for the other team. But I feel like, he, actually, you know, that makes me question. Why did he say yes so quickly? Was it out of, like, a love and respect? Or was he just playing the game? Oh, I'm going to have just ruined Jorah for myself. <laughs> Well, I mean, except, except that, I mean, this was something I was, I was saying also to friends this morning. Like, I think that for me in the show, um, the end of, of season one, when, when she, you know, doesn't burn and has baby dragons, and that's amazing. And I think that one of the coolest things is, like, his devotion at that point, because that's the moment for me. And I feel like what's amazing about that is, like, we would all be there anyway, right? That is an amazing end of a season. Mm -hmm. And, 
But because we are watching it partly through the eyes of, of someone who is Westerosi, that adds layers to, to our own excitement of that. And the amazing thing is that from that moment on, I 100% believe that he was, he was hers from that moment. And it was really neat for us. And I think it was a really great introduction to how magic was going to become more and more part of the story for us to watch a Westerosi react to that moment of saying, okay, like just basically he's just like, okay, everything has changed now. Yeah, yeah I think I, I remember now. I think he didn't say yes, he didn't say absolutely. I think he said, you have my sword and you have my life if it should come to that or something like that. No. Yeah. yeah, I think I, I remember now. I think he didn't say yes, he didn't say absolutely. I think he said, you have my sword and you have my life if it should come to that or something like that. And it seemed genuine or at least well, it's up to our interpretation. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Once you see somebody walk into a fire and come out with Whoa. dragons, yep. I mean, who knows what could exist? I mean, exactly. like I feel demons, like I feel gods, like all manner of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it's right. It's incredible. I mean, it's it. You know, it's like the episode before that we had Ned lose his head, yeah. which like was like, okay, this story is different yeah. than most stories. <laughs> and then we have that, and it's like, okay, now all the rules have changed. Yeah. Exactly. And also, it's kind of interesting, like as a viewer, like it, you're probably viewing it this similarly, similarly to how Jora is viewing it, because you know mm -hmm. we, we don't live in a real magic world, um, and. Jorah at, at this point doesn't either, and so it's just like we're kind of channeling him at that point. Um, and it makes, I mean, it makes Danny all the more powerful in that scene. I love Absolutely. I yeah. love specifically says that she lays the wood from ice to fire, and that's really an interesting mm -hmm. bit of language. And then there are specific places where she places the eggs at the head, at the heart, and at the groin. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just a lot of symbolism. And, and she, even when the flames are burning, she sees shapes in the flames which is very interesting because we know other people right. can see things in the flames. So it's curious as to how she knew to do this because she wakes up, she knows her baby's dead, right. knows exactly what she needs to do. It's almost like that knowledge was implanted into her mind somehow. Yeah, there is a very interesting relationship between her subconscious and, and her conscious actions. And I think that's a really interesting thematic thing You speak well. of her not being afraid. That was also after a dream. Every time she dreams, something changes about her in the first book. Yeah, I will hmm. not look back. Yeah. yeah. George has been on record as saying, granted, I got off a website, but um, he says that he wanted her magic to be half instinctual. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's like, he did, my guy, Brandon Sanders, oh, my guy's George R. R. Martin, but uh, also. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's like, he did, my guy, Brandon Sanders, oh, my guy's George R. R. Martin, but uh, also Brandon Sanders is another great author. He has very, like, scientific calculated uh, magic systems, but George, he want whatever, the, read the full quote, you'll like it, it's pretty yeah. cool. That's interesting, so there's like an almost Cause embedded, embedded, I mean, we know that it is embedded in her that body. Been and only, only death can pay for life. That yeah. seems to, trans to go into most magics, potentially all magics, but mm -hmm. then above and beyond that, there's things like love and hate. Like she even says to, um, she, says, she either says or thinks it in that final scene, Dana Daenerys 10, she's like, uh, there, are, there are powers stronger, older and stronger than hatred. And to me, that means mm -hmm. love. Like she's sort of, so you're leveraging love, you're leveraging life as a source for, or you're leveraging taking someone's life to raise, or hatch eggs. So I don't know, it's a very complicated magic system, but it's beautiful. And Daenerys, she wouldn't be the first magically gifted Targaryen girl. Daenys the dreamer foresaw the doom of Valyria. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that Daenerys is also having these prophetic dreams and they have similar names as well. So I wonder if that was yeah, on purpose. Huh. Yeah. No, that I is that is really interesting. I mean, and it has a whole, it has a really interesting kind of mind-body aspect to it. That that we know that her body is tied to her magic, but the idea that her subconscious might be tied to her magic as well is really it interesting. It was it was her connection with those eggs, her being in contact with them that awoke in them somehow. We don't mm -hmm. know exactly how. It's a bit esoteric, but you know, it's fine with me. I, li yeah. I like my magic that way. Yeah, same here. <laughs> I also wonder, like, how, how much did all this dreaming and this magical magicalness with the dragons, like, how much of that um, affects her psychology? Because, you know, that can, I imagine that could really go to your head. Um, like, okay, I'm supposed to be doing something pretty big here, and um, I guess I have to do that. And it, it just, I feel like it just gets you in a mindset. Yeah. Um, and it, apparently, and it, it, is, it is apparent towards the end where, like she just kind of snaps, and and, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. And she's got all these people coming to her saying you're special, and you gotta like quaith in the book. Gotta do this. You gotta do this. You gotta watch out for these people. And then it's interesting in the show. She's like, I was born to save the world. Why wouldn't you believe that? 
if you walked into a fire and you got dragons, you've heard all these prophecies about you, it seems like you're fulfilling this great destiny that's, that's been prophesied for thousands of years, and it seems like it's you. Why wouldn't you think that? Totally. I mean, that seems like walking into a fire and coming out with dragons yeah. seems like a confirmation that I'm special. I don't know. <laughs> A bit. <laughs> right, but then, you, but then you get exactly back into where we yeah, started this exactly. conversation of like, what does specialness mean? Yeah. What does what does that allow for? What you know, the kind of larger philosophical and and ethical questions yeah. of like, where does that take us then? Because that's exactly that's exactly why I find that her her storyline, if not always perfectly executed. I can't, I'm sorry, I just keep out the like you know, the moments where you're so excited about all of this to the moment where you question yourself. And the story is doing that as well. It is making us as viewers, readers, experiencers of her story, it is forcing us to also ask ourselves those questions. Yeah. And I think that as a reader, I think it even makes us hurt more at, towards the end, like, you know, you're seeing somebody who, I, I feel like you, there's so many forums and um, websites just dedicated to, like, prophecies of the undying and mm -hmm. um, prophecies of Danny's dreams, prophecies of Danny um, at the last chapter in uh, Dance of Dragons. Um, there's, there's so much theorizing and so much, like, oh my god, she's going to become this great, powerful character, and I think that as a, a person reading, reading slash viewing this, viewing this, it was that much more difficult to take in the last, her, the bells, that episode. Right. You know, right. Oh, you know what's interesting? That this just clicked like a couple days ago. The bells, there's a Dothraki, I keep spitting, sorry. The Dothraki wear bells, like, right, in their hair. It's like, war, not to warn that they're coming, they're just so badass that they'll roll up like, yo, you're gonna, you're gonna, be afraid because you're going to hear the bells coming. I haven't been able to like really connect it to the bells in the final scene, but I did think that someone smarter than me probably could make a connection between the doctor and the bells. <laughs> and the bells, um, yeah, the bells. Yeah. I wonder about how Daenerys, uh, talking about the show, like let's say like 500 years from this, I wonder how she'll be remembered, right? Because she, if you look at what she did, she went and she burned down King's Landing. Big whoop. She just freed all the slaves in the East, changed everything. They lifted her up and called her Misa. That has serious, like, religious kind of undertones. So she went and she burned down King's Landing. Big whoop. She just freed all the slaves in the East, changed everything. They lifted her up and called her Misa. That has serious, like, religious kind of undertones. So Daenerys is kind of a martyr at this point. I, I could see, like, a thousand years from now, they will pray to the name Misa. Interesting. The woman that birthed dragons into the world. Well, also, the way her story is told yeah. in Essos. And She's way, a messianic figure. The way her story figure. is told in Westeros are yeah. different, different, oh, right. different sure. stories. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be the Westerosi version, right. and then they'll be the Eastern version. And George will yeah. write both of them. Yeah. <laughs> did she do Immediately, great things, I'm sure that'll she happen do bad things? <laughs> do you think that uh, Grey Worm's going to survive the butterflies? <laughs> He's dying. <laughs> They're all going to die. Okay, so I had a question. Um, I, I wanted to know, this is totally not on the list. I'm going off the list now. Um, I feel like season eight um, framed her, her emotional torment as one of losing love. I think the show was definitely telling us that what is, bothering, what, what is breaking her is losing love. I feel like the three versions of this story that make sense to me um, would be that that's one of them, although it's my least favorite of the three. The second one is more about power, that she's losing belief, that she had, again, she started with all these good intentions, but but power and people believing in you, like you just reminded me of that when you're saying this, like the idea of people believing in you is a very intoxicating uh, experience. Um, which is different than just conquering and ruling. It's the idea that, that you are special. Yeah. Um, so that could be a motivator, is like the, the, the experience of losing that, and the other is losing the characters that, um, losing the people that helped her not go down this road. Yeah, okay, so people, yeah, I agree with all that. People like to throw around this, with all that, people like to throw around this idea that Targaryens snap suddenly and just do crazy stuff. 
But like, give me an example of a Targaryen that's done that. All the Targaryens that have been crazy, they've had consistent patterns of craziness. Right, exactly. Uh, the show doesn't it's support like that yeah. argument at all. So like, there's it, nothing in the show that tells us that story before her. Exactly, exactly. Ares was mad for 20 years. Viserys was pretty, pretty much a loose cannon. Maegor the he was just, He was when just you, awful. I don't know, yeah. I don't know if Viserys when you was, say like, snap, was, you, was mad, I think. You're saying they don't snap as in they become They don't completely. just suddenly, they don't have I like a help everyone, like but then I'm just gonna kill them. But there are moments where they snap momentarily, I think all humans do that. I'm not going to snap and kill a bunch of people exactly. when, I can just, when I can just literally I mean, kill the queen that's sitting right so, there looking out the right. window. Right. No, I think, I mean, I think that that's what... That's, Some people do, though. But why would she do that? It doesn't make sense for that well, character at that but point. But, like, a lot, people just, yeah, I don't want to make this real about real life, but, um, yeah, people do, sometimes it's like, I never would have thought that guy would have done that kind of thing. You never would have thought that guy would have done that kind of thing, you know? Right, but I think what we have to talk about, though, is within, right, yeah. within the, the format of what the story yeah, has yeah. given us. And I feel you know, like the story has given us temper, but she, yeah. again, the question is, I guess, I guess my question for you all, and I, don't, I haven't formulated an answer to this, is like, do we feel like she was good at reining herself in, or did she always need other people to help her do that? I, I feel like she, it's both, but I think that she had been, she had had enough experiences of reining herself in, that we have so many moments of that. I think she's definitely drawn to power. I mean, I think that's something that absolutely happens. Um, I want to take, um, one thing in my rewatch right before this con that I noticed is like in the first, it's, I think it's the first episode. Yes, it is the first episode. In the first episode, when she's, when she is, when Khal Drogo shows up for the first time, she's so scared. She's so scared. And yet, this was what I noticed with, with the, and yet, this was what I noticed with, with the, and I, you know, I, I'm a person who doesn't really care about ethereal intent so much. So, but what, when I was watching it, what I noticed is that, um, What's, his, what's the Magister's name? I'm sorry. The Magister goes up to talk to Khal Drogo, and she and Viserys are standing behind. And she starts, even before she's called up to Khal Drogo, she starts walking towards him. And Viserys oh, really? has to actually grab her hand really? and pull her back to like, say something awful, because that's what he does. And, and I, that was a really striking first moment to watch, is that she was almost sleepwalking at that point. Mm. And yet still, even though she's terrified of this man, she was somehow walking towards power, mm. which was really interesting. I thought that was a really interesting image um, to start out her story. And I don't know, I, I don't have an answer. And, you know, I guess, I guess that could be a criticism of the show that I feel like the show didn't hand us, not that we need to be handed easy answers. But is what you're going for right now. But there is a line, because mm -hmm. like, I, I, you're right. Like, I wish some, they had... There are some other ways they could have built to this in the show. I, I personally love the show. I thought it was great. But there's this awesome line in the books. I just caught it now. I don't know how I always overlooked it. So she's thinking about bringing Jorah back to him because everything's terrible in, uh, in Marine, right? She's thinking about bringing Jorah back. And, she, and there's, in a single sentence, she goes, I could send Dario out to get Jorah or to kill him. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> like, in the same sentence, to go get him, to like, go get Jorah for help or kill him. Like, how are those two even on your head at the same time? They're totally I mean, different. But she does, at that point, she kind of has a hate-love relationship. She's like, I, I really... Sorry. Sure. Keep talking. Like, I, I mean, yeah, she kind of has a love. Because in the, sh in the show, it's a little different. Because they make it like, oh, he's so sad about leaving. But in the book, he's like, I'm not apologizing. He's like, F you. I, I'm like, I've been helping you this whole time. And so, like, she, she's forced to send him away. It's not even like she, she does it apologizing. He's like, F you. I, I'm like, I've been helping you this whole time. And so like, she, she's forced to send him away. It's not even like she, she does it because it's like, oh, get out. She's, she's willing to give him a chance, but he doesn't. And then Jorah is also just, I hate him. I hate him so. <laughs> <laughs> he's like 40 and she's like 12 or something. And he's like grabbing her and kissing her. It's super yeah, weird yeah, and no. gross. Yeah, book Jorah. Book Jorah. I'm just I mean, happy yeah. to know that Jorah, there is no particular. way that Joanna Robinson is in this room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was saying. Whatever. Sorry. I hate Jorah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Um, do you all want to? Like, does anyone want to say a last thing and then should this we? Listen, in defense of Jorah, real quick. Like his member, his um, his se his second wife. Wait, wait. This is not the Jorah panel. I will not stand for this becoming the Jorah panel. No, just, well, it's one of the greatest lines in the story, right? Mira reads. It's, I'll go from Mira Reed to Jorah. So Mira's walking up north, and she's like, up and down and down and up and up and down. I hate these hills of yours, Bran. And Bran's told me about hills, but um, I don't know, I've never seen them. And then she's like, uh, but I love them. He's like, well, they're totally different things. And then 
Jojen jumps in in his solemn voice and he's like, if ice can burn, then love and hate can mate. Great and Jor, that's exactly what happens to Jorah. It's like he, she, she asks him about his story. He's like, he, we all carry our ghosts with us. And he's talking about Lynesse, his second wife, who looked like Daenerys. And then at the end of that story, she's like, because she went to, um, she, she's now like the uh, concubine and like headmistress of some guy. She's like, do you, do you hate her? And he's like, yes, almost as much as I love her. Sad. Ice can burn, then love and hate can meet. I still hate him. <laughs> <laughs> there is one thing that, that has clearly come out of this panel. There is one thing we know for sure. <laughs> Should we open it? Yeah, we can open up a question. Okay, would you all like to ask questions? I didn't understand the mechanics of that. There is a there microphone There is a microphone, somewhere. I think, somewhere down this way. Yeah. Ooh. Do it. Okay, and if you specifically want one of us to answer the question, if otherwise we'll just all jump on it. Yeah. Um, I don't really care who answers. It can be four of you if you guys want. Um, so my one question to you guys is, what did you take away from... Daenerys' downfall. For all of us watching, you know, her just kind of growing from, you know, being a child's bride to becoming the, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word savior, but certainly, you know, she uh, gave freedom to slaves and that counts for something. And, uh, you know, you root for her all this time and you know that she has all these inner conflicts yeah. And so I guess my question is, what do we who were rooting for her this whole time take away from this? Does this mean that, you know, predeterminism is just what it is? And if, if there's something bad in you, then you cannot fight it. Um, should we all just give up if we have some, you know, mental health issues that she had or magic, you know, call it what you will. Um, so, you know, when I watched the show, that was really heartbreaking to me because I identified with her a lot. And mm -hmm. what would you say to people like that? I mean, um, that's a, it's a tough question. Um, you know, I've loved this character for so long and to see this happen. And also for me, seeing how it was handled was very difficult for me to swallow. And, you know, my takeaway is that there's a lot of layers to people. There are, very, there are people who can get drunk on power very easily. And, you know, power isn't, like, the best thing. <laughs> I, I think uh, most people know that, but, like, it's a very good reminder of, like, you know, stay humble. And power can be a powerful drug. Yeah. I don't know what they're trying to say with this, honestly. I mean, this is the question that I think about at like 3 a.m. Like, what message is this sending yeah. to everyone? This is the biggest television show in the world. I feel like I, th I right? think you about can it say all the something. time. You can really say something with this, but they chose not to, and it really bothered me. Um, I'm going to avoid the... No, I'm not going to. I'm going to just say real quickly, everyone should watch Black Sails, because you have very satisfying <laughs> magic hero stories, and some of them are women. But the thing I am going to say about this is, uh, yeah, I don't... I said, I think I've said pretty clearly throughout that I don't like the execution of, of her downfall. I, I am not against the fact that she has a downfall. Um, the tragic hero is a noble, noble archetype. It is a person who struggles to be good even when it's difficult to them, which is very different than punishing someone. And I think a lot to be good even when it's difficult to them, which is very different than punishing someone. And I think a lot of people have experienced this as her being punished for, and I think in the execution there is some of that, but there was the potential for her to exist in a heroic space that is usually only male characters get to be. The character who strives to be good despite aspects of themselves that make it hard. And that striving is what I focus on. And the opportunity to have a female character be that person, be that complicated, be that messed up, and not just a villain. I love villains. You know, Cersei's really satisfying villain, right? She's awesome. But to be in that really uncomfortable space of wanting to be good and having aspects of yourself that work against that is usually a space only male characters get to be in. So even if the last part of it was as a whole, 
they were trying very hard to create this kind of complex hero that struggles. And I really appreciate having a female character be that. I, one takeaway that I would take, that I've been thinking of too is like, you know, I, I don't think everybody is going to go out on an end note, whether that's in TV or real life. And um, I hope that everybody remembers the entire story rather than just one moment yeah. um, in life. Oh, so. I can't get over the fact that she died begging a man that didn't want to be with her to be with her. Yeah, no, no, that was so she's messed like, up. She's like, that is so messed be up. be with me, Joan Snow. Right. It's like she, she wasn't angry when he stabbed right. her. She's just like, oh, sad. Right. I don't know. She should have spit blood in his face. Uh. <laughs> In the words of the late, great Stannis Baratheon, Stannis of the House Baratheon, a good, a good act does not wash out the bad, nor a bad the good. Each deserves its own reward. Yeah, and she's, I, I does not wash out the bad, nor a bad the good. Each deserves its own reward. Yeah, and she's, I, I'll always love her. Like I said, I started this panel off by saying that my favorite characters and people in life. Actually, yeah, I was wearing like a, like a Rosa Parks. I guess that's not technically very, it is. Uh, I love Breakers of Chains. Um, so it was very tragic end, but uh, I'll always love her. Yeah. <laughs> well, and she was an imperfect breaker of chains. I mean, you could argue that she wasn't always so good at listening to the people that she was breaking the chains of, but that also comes, that's also an interesting dichotomy. That's also an interesting yeah. space for, to watch a character struggle. Yeah, and I think you're allowed to struggle um, maybe not, you know, Danny definitely went, took a really quick turn into bad, bad town, but like, um, y you know, uh, you're, you're not, you should never be measured by one action, I don't think. You, you need to be measured even by... Even if it's burning children. The <laughs> I think it there's depends on the There's mul so many things that go into making you who you are. What about Hitler? Oh shit! I don't want to go I mean, there. <laughs> I mean, there's there there are certain acts that you can do that that's you now. Yeah. Like, this is what you're about. I mean. Well, and there is the larger question that I I did want to get to that we didn't get to of like of of magic and power in this. I mean, there's the you the minute you hand somebody three dragons in a story, even if you know she loses two of them, but even if you hand someone one dragon in a story, you suddenly are required to demand more of them. I mean, she has been under the pressure of her own power but I through think this the, whole story. I think the magic would say, um, is it worth it? Right. Um, to kill all the White Walkers, to make dragons, something like that. There's a cool line from Miri, uh, right, when she, I don't know if it's in the books, to be honest, but when Dan, Danny yells at her in the show and Miri's like, well, look at your call and see what life, this goes back to your question mm -hmm. you know, for like the love, power, there's the self-fulfilling prophecy, all those things do play a fun prophecy, all those things do play a factor, but for me, since I'm just like the, that hopeless, corny, romantic, it's, um, the, yeah, it's like, <laughs> look at your call and see what life is worth when everything is gone. And so ultimately, for me, the biggest factor was law, love or the, the loss of the people whom she loved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what has to happen. She has to lose that, I think, in the books, if that happens. But, yeah. I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, we're yeah. done. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.